So now to the book of Luke. We have been uh, in the book of Luke now for, what, about a year now. It's a long time. Uh, we are now in the chapter of 12, Luke 12. Last week, we saw Jesus calling for all of those who were following him to put their heart on things above, on heaven, because where their treasure is, there their, their, their heart will be also. And this week, we are going to see another challenge that Jesus has for us. And I want you to consider your own life, where you stand, and ask yourself, do I follow Jesus in this way? Or do I just call him Lord and come on Sunday? Because for a lot of people, being a Christian means that you grew up as a Christian or that you attend church occasionally or even that you've had an experience at some point where you felt like God was with you. But here Jesus wants us to follow him in a very particular way. And this does tie in with the table talk this morning. Uh, we'll begin reading in verse um, 37. Oh, 36. We'll go to 36, get the whole paragraph in. Um, start in verse 36 of Luke chapter 12. And ye yourselves like unto men and what that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding that when he cometh and knocketh they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth to serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants and this know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken through be ye therefore ready for the son of man cometh at an hour when ye think not let's open with the word of prayer Lord Jesus, we do thank you for your word. We ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts, open our minds, that we would understand and behold wonderful things out of thy law. Father, we ask that you would keep us, protect our uh, thoughts from the wicked one who would steal away um, every uh, thought and attention. And Lord, we ask that we would begin to follow you as you would have us. Amen. <clears throat> we have here a parable of Jesus in the hearing of a large multitude. We could go back to that and see at the beginning of the chapter that it was a, a great company, probably the largest that Jesus had had to this point. So many that they were stepping on one another. So it was a big group of people. And Jesus is speaking out loudly and not, you know, hiding these things. This is his reason for being there. Uh, we often point out Jesus went around doing good, healing people, and other things like that. But Jesus' main purpose was always to preach, to teach, to encourage, to speak his parables. These were his main focus. We see there in verse 36, Jesus begins a parable in that he says, Ye yourselves like unto men. He's making a simile or a comparison between those who are there and are hearing him and what they are supposed to do. They are supposed to be like someone who is expectantly waiting. There in verse 36, they're waiting for their Lord to come from a wedding that they may open unto him immediately. Now, 
you have to have in your mind that picture of excitement that mostly only kids have. You know, when they're expecting someone to be coming, like maybe their grandparents or a friend who's stopping by and they're waiting for them to come. And every time the wind rustles the trees out the front or a bird shadow goes across the front driveway, they're popping their head out the door, waiting expectantly. This is the picture. Jesus says, look, you need to be watching and not just casually sitting back, you know, looking at, across the field once in a while, but actively looking, looking for any excuse to say, oh, is that Jesus? Is that Jesus? Is that Jesus? Because these men in this parable are waiting for their Lord. Uh, that word Lord just means someone who is the master or the boss man, <laughs> but also a friend. Here, this Lord, this person that they were responsible to, would expect them to open the door and to open it immediately. Jesus then says, blessed are those servants who will be doing what there in verse 37? What is it that he said is, is going to make them blessed? It says, if they are found to be watching. If when Jesus comes, they are watching. Notice Jesus at this point is not condemning those who fail to watch. He's rather stating the goal. The goal is for us to reach um, that time when he comes and be watching. That's the aim. That's our main focus. What are some of the benefits in this parable when the Lord comes and his servants are found watching and are able to open the door immediately? Notice what he says in verse 37. He will gird himself, make them to sit down to meet and will serve them. This is quite an honor and a blessing. I don't know about you, but I enjoy food. I enjoy eating. But you know what's better than food is when you don't have to cook it yourself. And all of the ladies say, yay! <laughs> That's exactly how it works. It's always more fun when you don't have to prepare it yourself. And so here these servants are going to be served by their Lord. That's a high honor. That's something to be looked after. If you, if you are, are a servant and your Lord takes care of you just for doing your job, that's a good master to serve. Jesus continues on and says, if he shall come in the second watch or in the third watch and find them so, that is, watching, blessed are those servants. Again, he's pointing out that it doesn't matter how long it's going to take. Whether it's the very first minute you start looking or whether it's six hours in and it's really getting difficult. Um, I don't know if you've ever waited up for something that you're interested in, uh, but if it just takes forever to get going, oh, it can be the longest wait. But here... Jesus then switches up the parable and he says, if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would have come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken through. Here the parable is turned on its head because now it is the good man, the one that's supposed to be identified with, is not the servant who's waiting for his Lord, but rather the good man who owns the house, who is house is being broken into and Jesus says if he had known when he would have waited up and he would have protected his house and so the picture is you need to be ready and Jesus actually says that in verse 40 be ye therefore ready also this is a command Jesus is speaking to a large crowd full of very different people as we've already seen, there are Pharisees, there are scribes, there's the disciples, there's people who want to be healed. There's a huge crowd of people with many different 
ideas, responsibilities, and concerns about Jesus. And he calls out to them and says, be ready. It's a command. Be ready. For the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. Jesus' death was still future at this point, And this is definitely pointing towards his death. When he was declared as the Son of Man and he was rejected. Truly, the people around him, they saw him and they did not think that it was the right time, the right place, or that he was the right man. They were completely blinded to the fact that Jesus was there for them at that moment. And when he died, they were either sorrowful or rejoicing, but not for the right reasons. <laughs> they did not understand what it was that Jesus was doing for them. He came at an hour and they did not expect it. They should have been. And he's calling for them to look for his appearing. Peter was a bit confused by this parable, as we too could be confused. And he says in verse 41, Lord, speaketh thou this parable unto us or unto everyone? This is a good question to ask. When Jesus or anyone else makes a parable or an illustration, it is good to look at it and say, does this apply? How does this apply to me? It would be nice if we could always go to Jesus and ask, now, Jesus, this parable, could you explain it a bit more? Because I'm a bit slower than Peter was, and I'm not quite as smart as Paul or Luke or some of these other guys. Can you break it down a little bit for me? It would be nice to be able to go to him. But I do say to you, if you know Jesus as your Savior and the Holy Spirit is inside of you, then yes, ask him to make it plain to you. Ask him to make it clear. It'll take some work on your part. It'll take some time and digging and meditating, but he will make his word plain. Rely on it. Ask for it. Depend on it. Jesus was asked the question, so let's now look at his answer. And this is where we'll put the bulk of the time into Jesus' answer because he does spell it out very um, detailed. There's a lot of details in here about how you're supposed to watch, how you're supposed to be ready. The Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household? We could just stop there and preach a whole sermon about how Jesus wants us to be wise stewards, how he wants us to be faithful, how he wants us to rule over his household. All of those things are big concepts. But I want you to take this from Peter's perspective and think about how he would have heard this. He would have immediately said, well, maybe not everyone in the crowd, but for certain, me. And really, this is how Jesus speaks. He speaks to the whole crowd, and yet really he is speaking to each individual one. He doesn't leave anyone out. When he speaks, he is trying to build faith in everyone. He's trying to draw all of them unto himself. From whatever point they're at, he wants them closer. This is what Jesus wants. And so Peter would have been looking and saying, well, maybe me, maybe James, maybe John. You know, one of us would be that wise and faithful steward. Surely we're the ones as we serve Jesus, we serve the Lord. He will make us ruler. <laughs> um, so get that picture in your mind here. Peter is already focusing in. He's thinking, this is me. Jesus is talking to me. 
In verse 43, he says, Blessed is that servant. Notice that word, that. It's very easy to skip over some of these words. Blessed is that servant. Before it was just a servant, the servants, but now it is that servant. This is the specific servant he's just mentioning before who thinks of himself as a faithful and wise steward. Someone who is dedicated to the service of their Lord. That servant is blessed only when, says, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. That is, serving. We could make a, a whole series on how to be a good servant of the Lord. And we won't. We could. Because it's a big topic. You know, it's not what has Jesus done for me, but what have I done for him? He has saved me, yes, but what have I done for him? How unworthy I am for his salvation, but what have I done in response to that great gift? We could make a huge, like I said, series on that. But instead, Jesus points out that the servant should be serving and the thing that's blessed is if they're doing it when he comes. That is if they're continuing on. If they don't fail. If they're faithful in their service. It is also interesting here that he doesn't describe what kind of servant. You know, is this a servant who goes out in the fields and is a low paid grunt worker? Or is this the, you know, manager that you put in an office who's, you know, got the brains and they're making the big bucks? Is that the servant he's talking about? All of them, any of them, doesn't matter what they're doing in service for the Lord. They could be doing the lowliest thing. In fact, in other places, Jesus describes how even giving a glass of water in his name that's a very small service like that. That's a very temporary, very small service. It's something that most people can do for themselves. Um, even four year olds can get the water out of the tap. You know, it's not it's not rocket science. But if it's done in Jesus's name, if it's done for the benefit of that other person. Wow. Jesus calls that good service. So it's not about the size of the service here. It's not about the position that this particular servant has over the other servants. It is about their faithfulness in doing that which they have been called to do. And what is faithfulness? We'll stop here for a second and just say, what is faithfulness? It doesn't just mean full of faith, although you could break it down that way. It means Consistency in application. Consistency in the action. A faithful or dependable car will start up every time you need it to. That's what Jesus is saying here. A faithful and a wise servant. They will be doing the work that they were called to do continuously and when their master comes, they'll still be doing it. A few times when giving the gospel to um, someone, often older people, they say something along the lines of, oh, I've got a few years left of life and maybe then I'll turn to God. Maybe then I'll repent or I'm not ready yet. I'll do it later. The same thing can often be said of Christians who, instead of serving God in the way they know they should now, say, well, after I'm a bit older, after I've done some more training, or after I've, um, you know, learned all the things in the Bible, then I will begin. You know, after a stirring message, then I'll go out. Mm -hmm. They are, as it were, looking forward into the future which no one can see, and they're saying, oh, in a, in a certain time, then I'll begin to serve God the way he's asked. 
And then Jesus will find me doing the right thing. No, if you want to be a servant who is found doing the right thing, you must. You must begin now and continue. And continue and continue and continue serving Jesus till he comes and takes you home because then he will have found you serving him. You can't put it off. You can't say, oh, well, I'll do it once a year. And then if Jesus happens to come then, then we're, we're smiling. No, serve God. Serve him. Be faithful at it. I want us to notice also that we have heard the word servant a dozen times already in this passage. Um, but now we're also hearing the word blessed over and over and over and over again. Do you understand that this word blessed means they should be joyful and happy because they have reached it. They've made the pinnacle. They've made the top. They have reached the best they can get. It is receiving that present that just makes you smile. Jump on your face. Blessed. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he cometh shall find so doing. Watching. Watching is not passive. I guess this is another way to put what we've already discussed. Watching is not a passive thing. You have to be excited and enthusiastic about it. But if you're watching for Jesus is, yep, I'm saved and now I'm going to fold my arms, sit back and the rest of the world can just go away. <laughs> Leave me alone. I'm going to die someday and then I'll go home to be heaven. That is not watching. Even if you're keeping yourself from sin, you're not watching Watching is being faithful in your service to the master, to the Lord. If we jump down to verse 45, we have Jesus describing how some people fail. These are servants, but they are not good servants. But and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens and to eat and drink and be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and an, at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in sunder and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. We could describe this next section as Jesus's ranks of evil. Um, nowadays, it's popular to rank things like your favorite movies or your favorite, you know, um, yeah, game players. I don't know. Anyways, I'm not really big on that, but it's good to compare and kind of set up some different levels here. And Jesus starts out with a pretty bad level. This is probably the worst. This level is the servant whose heart has left serving. And really that's where it begins in their heart. Notice there Jesus says the servant says in his heart. It's really his heart that's gone the wrong way. It's not the fact of all of these bad things that he then does after it. Those are all bad. But his heart left serving his Lord. And so Jesus condemns him. He doesn't say, blessed is this servant. He says, but, and if that servant, say in his heart. What happens to him? At the end of verse 46, he gets cut in sunder. And he gets appointed a portion with the unbelievers. This might not, um, our, this might sound like Jesus is saying he's going to send us to hell. That's not what's on offer here. This is Jesus talking about the unbelievers who had to live outside the city, who had to be separate from the people of Israel. 
the ones who were not allowed to own the properties because that was reserved for the inheritance that God had given to each tribe and each um, family in that tribe in Israel. And so when he talks about their portion being di divided with the unbelievers, that's basically they're being disinherited, kicked out. Here, this servant is going to be cut into pieces and even their children will not inherit the good things that they should have been able to pass on to them. What are these bad things that they have done? Again, let's look at their rank. Here's this person, this servant. He's left off his heart from serving. He then begins to doubt his Lord's coming. He says, it's been 2,000 years, if Jesus was going to come, he would have come. I mean, really, look at all of the bad things that have happened. Why is Jesus delayed? Maybe he's not coming. Maybe we got it wrong. This leads to actions. What are some of those actions? Well, he begins to beat the men, servants, and maidens, eat, drink, and be drunken. He begins to view himself as the master. These are things that masters shouldn't do, but masters could do. They could punish those who were under them. And they could eat all that they wanted and, as it says there, be drunken. They could eat to excess, drink to excess. They didn't have to worry about fulfilling their duties. When we have a problem in our hearts, it comes out in our actions. And really, if we are to serve God, we must serve him with our whole heart. That will be the best preventative from falling into these problems. Falling into eating, drinking, and being drunken, and beating those that we have no right to beat. I want us to see also that the Lord of that servant will come when the servant is not looking. Now, I've never been drunk, thankfully, but I hear it's not all that fun afterwards. Uh, but there's one thing sure. If you've drunk much, you lose a bit of your perception. And if you've drunk a lot, of alcohol, you're unable to be alert. And you're likely to sleep in the next day. You're unlikely to be first up. And so if you take this position of the Lord's not coming back and I'm going to rule my own life and I'm going to do my own things, you're going to push out any opportunity for doing the right things because you'll be so full of your consumption. This is an error that we too can fall into. And again, how do we keep from it? Guard our hearts. <laughs> keep a watch. If our heart starts to wander at all, if we start to entertain the thought that maybe, maybe it's not worth serving God anymore, or maybe it's just been too long and we need some you know, we need to just give it all up and enjoy ourselves, then we need to check our heart. <laughs> Let's look at the next rank of servant, and you tell me whether this one is above or below. <clears throat> Verse 47, And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. We are not given the, how would you say it, the, the root cause for this failure, although I would say it's probably also a heart issue. This servant knows what he should be doing and doesn't do it. What is his punishment, his reward? 
he shall be beaten with many stripes. Now, you might look at that and you say, OK, that's pretty harsh to be beaten at all. is not fun to be beaten with many stripes. That doesn't sound fun at all. Uh, something we should strive to avoid. Maybe this servant is slightly better rank than the other one, but again, not blessed. OK, so I want us to see these these servants here are fighting for last place. They're not fighting for first place. All right. We had the one about first place earlier the the blessed servant the one who's watching and doing and faithful yep he's blessed he's up up at the top these ones are all fighting for last place this one is one step better than last he's not going to be cut in sunder his children are not going to be removed from their inheritance but he will be beaten with many stripes and truly this is one where we find ourselves often. We know what we should be doing. We know we should hand that gospel tract out. We got them. We put them in our pocket. We took them with us. And then we failed to hand them out. We knew we should have talked to that longtime friend about the disastrous way their life is going and point them to Jesus, the only one who could rescue them. But we just... No, nah, we couldn't do it. We just stopped ourselves. We knew what we should do, but we didn't do it. God says our punishment will be severe. Because it's evil. It's evil to avoid doing what you know God wants you to do. And really, I want to just um, take a little aside here. Too many people focus on the Bible and say, here's a list of do's and don'ts. And they forget that that do's and don'ts really should be, here's a list of things that you really ought to be focused on. These are the things you really need to be doing. And if you're doing those, you won't have time to be doing any of the wrong things. They'll preclude you, they'll keep you from doing the evil things if you are serving God with all your heart. So that, that needs to be our main um, attitude. So we have our servant whose heart said, the Lord's not coming again. Not, not going to happen. That servant, they're going to lose a lot. Then we have the servant who's going to have a great deal of punishment because they knew what to do and they said, no, nah, not going to do it. Don't know if it was just because they were feeling stubborn. They couldn't be bothered. You know, they're, they're too tired and too busy doing their own thing. We're not told why, but they knew what to do, and they just didn't do it. Verse 48, we have our third, third to last um, ranked servant. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required and to whom men have committed much much of him they will ask the more we have here the third from the last and this is the servant who doesn't bother to know what his master wants he turned off his ears when his master said and these are the things you need to do while i'm gone and so he blissfully ignorantly went about doing all of his own things because he didn't realize he should be doing service for his lord this servant again is not called blessed it is not acceptable in god's eyes to be ignorant of his will too many people say well if we don't know that such and such is a sin then it's not a sin to us if we don't know that this is displeasing to god then then surely he won't be hard with us on that no god will still beat them with few stripes i can tell you i don't want any stripes okay <laughs> not just don't want to be hit but this word stripes is like being hit with a whip that's going to tear the flesh okay we're not talking about a light punishment. 
This is going to be painful, severe punishment. Before we look at the of much, much shall be required um, aspect of this, I want to point out one thing. We have our ranking. We have the top servant who's done everything right, been faithful, served God straight to the end, and he's been found faithful at the end of his service, at the end of his life. And we've had the bottom three rungs of this ranking, the ones who didn't bother to know their Lord's will, those who knew his will, didn't do it, and those who assumed their Lord was not coming and treated themselves as masters. I want you to notice one thing that's common between all four of these ranks. They are all servants. They're not called my servant and then those people out there who aren't my servants. They're not called my servants and mine enemies. These are all God's servants. These are all the people who are his. The ones that he has redeemed and that he has called by his own name. His servants, the master's servants, and yet there are many different possible outcomes. We have a lot of free will in this aspect. As those who have come to Jesus for salvation, we've become his servants, and the outcome depends very much on what we do. Now again, I want to say, Jesus didn't say, if you do this for me, you're this kind of servant, and if you do that for me, you're this kind of servant. Instead, it's based on the faithfulness. If what God has called you to do is to give the glass of water, do it. Keep doing it. Make it your life's mission to be the best water carrier there could ever be. And continue doing it until he comes back. If he's called you to preach or to sing or to praise his name in some other way, do it. Don't stop. If he has called you to hand out tracts and you see on the wall there a map, we've done quite a few streets but it's taken us a long time. If he's called us to put tracks out and to tell everyone we know and meet about Jesus who's come to save, then we need to do it and be faithful at it. Because that's the only way we will get the blessed, the well done, good and faithful servant. That's the only way. I can tell you, I don't want to be any of those bottom three tears of servant. I don't want to. And I don't want you to be there either. Don't be ignorant of what God wants you to do. Figure it out. Go to him. Beg him to tell you what he wants you to do. And then do it. The end there of verse 48, Jesus puts a fine point on this discussion and he says, of, uh, sorry, <clears throat> For unto whom much is given, of him shall much be required. This is a, a common or well understood thing. This is what everyone does. When you go to McDonald's and you know the guy's getting paid minimum and they're still in high school, you expect this level of commitment. <laughs> you expect this level of service. You expect the hamburgers to turn out this well. But if someone's getting paid 10 times as much, and they're a chef, and they have the experience and all of that, you expect the burger to turn out way up here. Of course, if you're going to a chef for a burger, you probably should get something else. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying. We have a, a much more forgiving spirit for someone that we don't expect to have the experience, knowledge, strength, um, or to have been paid as well 
to maybe not care as much as someone who is paid more, has more experience, etc. Here we are told point blank that we will be required much. Because I'll ask you, when Jesus saved you, did he save you much or did he save you a little? You know, did he did he just get you out of the worst part of the hell and into the next to worst part of hell? That's what the Catholics think happens. No, that's not how it works. When Jesus died, he rescued me out from that is completely lifted me. No longer anywhere in the hell perspective of this. Completely rescued. It was a big thing. He didn't pull all of me out except for my pinky or my finger. He, he pulled my whole body, my whole soul. I'm out. He rescued me. He gave me so much. As we read in Mark, Jesus gave his life. That's a pretty big bucket. Even if it wasn't Jesus who is perfect, if someone else gave their life for you, you would be greatly indebted to them. You would consider every thought from that point on saying that person gave their life to make sure I could live. And you would think about that often because they gave you everything they had and Jesus had more than most to give up more than most to lose and he gave it up and he gave it to you it's been given to you what do you think will be required from you Who wants to see the second part of that is in uh, the very last phrases says and to whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more not only has jesus given us much benefits given us life given us uh, the ability to do what is right and good the ability to serve god all of those things that we could not have done without his gift but he has also committed unto us a charge, that is, a command, a request from the Lord. So, a command, a request. He has committed us a big request. Do you think he will demand back a big result? Or do you think he will be satisfied with a half-hearted result. I want to leave you with that question. If you know Jesus as Savior, you are his servant, what tier of servant are you? And there's a few in between, the top tier and the bottom tier, I'm sure. Uh, but really, if you can be faithful to God, you've reached the best you can be, regardless of how well you feel about it. Jesus wants you. He wants all of you. He wants you to be watching for him. Watching is not passive. Watching is not a request that we can ignore. Watching is required of us. Because Jesus has given so much for us. Let's close with a word of prayer.